Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jim Boutillier, and I have the honor and pleasure of serving as the moderator for today's Maritime Security Challenges webinar entitled Strategic Trends in the Pacific Islands Region. MSC was created in 2005, and over the years, we had eight international conferences bringing in experts on maritime and related affairs from around the world. The intervention of COVID, of course, has obliged us to recalibrate. And thus, we have turned to the webinar format. And this afternoon, we are particularly delighted to have as our guest, uh, Dr. Narcissus Kavatalaka. He is from Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands in the Southwest Pacific. He's an associate professor at the Center for Pacific Studies at the University of Hawaii Manoa campus. He's a man of enormous experience and exposure in terms of the world of Oceania. He served at the Pacific Islands Development Program Center in the East West Center, also on the University of Hawaii campus in um, Honolulu, and he was a professor at the University of the South Pacific in Suva, Fiji, which is a regional university which provides services for roughly 11 different political entities. He's the editor of the Pacific Islands Monograph Series, the founding editor of Ocean Currents, uh, forgive me, Oceania Currents, and a member of the editorial board of the Contemporary Pacific. Interestingly and notably, he was also the chief negotiator in the Solomon Islands peace talks in 2000. Uh, the islands sadly were roiled by uh, political unrest for half a decade, and these peace talks were absolutely critical. So he is the individual who's going to brief us on a corner of the world, which we tend to ignore, and we ignore at our apparel. Before we begin, however, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Lockheed Martin, MDA, General Dynamics, the Canadian Defense Review, Esprit de Corps, and Vanguard Magazine. And also to thank our MSC partners, the Navy League of Canada, and the Daniel K. Inoue Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Waikiki, Hawaii. The Pacific Island encompasses roughly half the globe. Scattered across that enormity are upwards of two dozen political entities. These are microstates. In many ways, they tend to be ignored by those who are fixated by great power politics. And yet great power politics impinge upon the world of Oceania. I had the good fortune of spending 20 years of my career traveling in the Pacific Islands. And indeed, uh, interestingly and pleasantly, spent much of that in the Solomon Islands where our guest speaker today is from. So without further ado, let me turn the floor over to Tarsisius Kambatalaka, our guest speaker today, to introduce us to the complexities of the Pacific Islands region. Tarsisius, please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. James Bodlier, for the kind words of introduction. Uh, I must also apologize. There's a construction going on in my apartment. So if you hear a lot of noise in the background, that's what it is. Uh, I hope it doesn't disturb us too much. Um, I want to begin by first thanking the organizers and the sponsors uh, of the Maritime Security Challenges Conference for the honor of inviting me and enabling me to participate in this conversation. And I look forward to hearing from others and learning from all of you. Uh, um, may, I, may I rudely interrupt uh, Tarsisius for one moment? I, I failed abjectly to note that um, I would urge the members of the audience uh, to ask questions at any time on their uh, Q&A chat uh, app and they will be collate, collated by the webinar staff. And uh, after uh, Dr. Kampatalaka has given his formal comments, uh, we will have an extended uh, 
Q and A uh, session, and that will give an opportunity for your questions to be addressed by him. Uh, apologies, please continue. No, that's that's fine, Jim. Thank you, thank you once again. Um, so what I want to do is to spend the next twenty or twenty-five minutes uh, to raise a number of issues about Oceania, and in particular, Oceania's place in the changing regional order and global order uh, that we are experiencing today, but focus specifically on how Pacific Island countries and Pacific Island peoples are responding to these things, uh, events that are happening around the world, but more specifically happening in the Pacific Islands. And what I want to do is talk about Oceania first as a space for geopolitical competition, uh, not only now, but a history of that kind of geopolitical competition. Uh, and then second, uh, I want to outline the changing global and regional order that's happening. Uh, and third, discuss Pacific Island responses uh, in this regional order and the assertive diplomacy of Pacific Islands, and then provide some concluding remarks. But I want to begin by doing two things. The first is I want to tell you a story. So I went to the University of the South Pacific in the mid 1980s as an undergraduate student. By the time I got there, the anti-nuclear movement and the independent Pacific movement were still at its height. And I became a student activist and joined a lot of these demonstrations in the streets of Suva, particularly the anti-nuclear movements. And I remember that one of our chance at that time was that if it is safe, dump it in Tokyo, test it in Paris, store it in Washington, D.C., but keep my Pacific nuclear free. I'll come back to this story later on and tell you why I'm telling you the story. The second thing I want to mention is something that is very obvious and which Jim mentioned as well. And that's the fact that the Pacific Ocean is huge. It covers a third of our planet's surface area. There's a poet by the name of Robin Jeffers who refers to it as the staring and sleeping eye of the earth. And the Pacific Ocean has attracted over, you know, since the 1500s, attracted a lot of attention from outside for a number of reasons. One is exactly because of its vastness and therefore potential resources that it has. And second is that it has provided a very important sea lane or sea lanes between different centers of political and economic powers. And we've seen this over time, beginning from say, you know, the 1500s to the 1800s for about 250 years, the Manila galleons that traveled through the Pacific from Asia to the Americas. So the Pacific Ocean was important then for that. The other reason why the Pacific Ocean is important is the idea of emptiness. And I want to emphasize this because the region is often seen not only as huge and expansive and beautiful, but it is also often seen as empty, a place that's waiting to be secured and occupied. The idea of emptiness, I think, is fundamental to geopolitical competition. A place is empty, therefore needs to be occupied and secured. And that's something that I want to come back to later on as well. So if we look at time, this idea of the Pacific needing to be occupied plays out in the colonial histories of these places. The vast potential for resources, the sea lane, the emptiness was central to the colonization of the Pacific Islands and the carving of the islands into colonial territories, many of which assume status as nation states later on. So the colonial territories later became independent nation states. It was also important during World War II and particularly the Pacific War, the involvement of Japan and the US. 
that became really, really profound during the Cold War period, where we see in, the, in Oceania the dominance of Western powers led by the US, Australia, and New Zealand, although New Zealand's much smaller, and of course France, which still has presence in the region in places like New Caledonia, French Polynesia, and Wallace and Futuna. And during that period, Western powers had the strategic denial approach to the region, denying access to other powers, particularly the former Soviet Union. So the regional order at that time in the period during the Cold War, after Second World War, up until the late 1980s, was the dominance of Western powers. That was the order at that time. And for much of the Cold War period, a lot of the Pacific Island countries were not independent or had just gained independence. Samoa in 1962, for instance, Nauru in 1968, and then later on places like Fiji in 1970 and Papua New Guinea 75 and others much, much later. The country where I come from, Solomon Islands, gained independence in 1978. I was in primary school at that time, but I remember very well the ceremonies we had in my village. But then after the Cold War period, we've seen, and I know this is something that a lot of you are familiar with, we've seen a certain degree of withdrawal by the Western powers, not absence. Of course, Australia and New Zealand have always been very present in Pacific Island places, Australia particularly in the region we know as Melanesia. And the US, of course, in the Northern Pacific, in the Compact of Free Association, territories of Palau, uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands, and of course, Guam, and American Samoa, and the French continue to have a presence. But it wasn't the same as it was during the Cold War era. But things have changed in the last 20, last two decades in particular. Uh, we've seen new powers in the region or a new power in the region. Uh, and we've seen a remapping of interests in the region. And here I use the term mapping and maps, not only figuratively, but literally the mapping of regions such as the Asia Pacific and now the Indo-Pacific. And I'll talk about that a little bit in, in a moment. The internal mappings of the region, the divisions between Melanesia, Polynesia and Micronesia, for instance, the sub-regions. And here mapping is important because it influenced the way in which we see these places. And also it influences the relationships that we have with them. The Asia Pacific, for a lot of Pacific Islanders, they are mostly absent from the economic discussions of the Asia Pacific region, except for New Zealand, Australia, and of course, Papua New Guinea nowadays. The Indo-Pacific mapping, which covers the Pacific Islands or the Oceania region and all the way to the in Indian Ocean, Pacific Island countries are mostly absent from a lot of the discussions. And so what's happened in the last 20 years, and we know, all know this very well, is the emergence of China and China's growing influence in the region. I think it is also important to note that whilst the Chinese state, and in particular, the Chinese Communist Party is relatively new to the Pacific Islands region, different manifestations of China have existed in the region for a very long time. Chinese people, for instance, uh, have been coming to the Pacific Islands for a long time in a lot of places around the 1800s and onwards. And this is important when we're looking at relationships with China, because these people also play an important role 
uh, in today's discussion as well. But in the last 20 years, we've seen an increase and assertive influence of the Chinese state in the Pacific Islands. In 2006, for instance, we had the first China Pacific Islands Economic Development Corporation Forum that was held in Nandi uh, in Fiji. And that started a very close relationship between Chinese government and Pacific Island governments. Although many of these governments had established diplomatic relations with China much earlier, Fiji, for instance, and Samoa and so forth. Also important is we've seen the inclusion of Pacific Island countries into the Belt and Road Initiative, particularly as part of the Maritime Silk Road. We've seen increase in Chinese assistance in the form of grants, of concessional loans, of interest-free loans. A lot of the assistance is in the form of concessional loans, which raises a lot of questions, not only or a lot of concern, not only for Pacific Islanders, but for other development partners as well. But it's also important to note that Chinese that the value of Chinese assistance in the region is much less compared to Australia, for instance. Australia is still one of the biggest donors in the Pacific Islands. And so while China, China's presence in the region became much more obvious and more assertive uh, and more visible in the livelihoods of governments and of businesses in the region, that raised concern for the US. And beginning from with the Obama administration, for instance, there are discussions about the rebalancing of its foreign policy to focus away from the Middle East and Europe to the Asia Pacific region, which includes this huge ocean that we are part of, the Pacific Ocean. And President Obama in his address to the Australian Federal Parliament in November 2011 said, and I quote, the United States is turning our attention to the vast potential of the Asia Pacific region. Our new focus on this reflects a fundamental truth. The United States has been and always will be as a Pacific nation. So the US assuming that identity as a Pacific nation as well, not just not just the United States of America, but part of the region. And through that refocusing of the US or rebalancing of US foreign policy, we eventually see the emergence of the idea as well as the strategy of the Indo-Pacific. So the idea of the Indo-Pacific as a region that's broader than just the Asia Pacific, a region that also includes the Indian Ocean uh, and the Pacific Ocean. So that idea then formed into a strategy for approaching global geopolitics, at least for, uh, for, for the US. So changes in geopolitical languages and thinking in Washington DC shifted from Asia Pacific to Indo-Pacific. Ideas of a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, and also rules based order. And a lot of these languages were used to counter China, to counter the growing influence of China. And also with it, the increasing securitization of diplomacy and economic development uh, in the Pacific Islands region. And suddenly, you know, beginning from after the, uh, after the first China Pacific Island development uh, Economic Development Forum, we see a renewed interest in the Pacific Islands, not just in the entire region, but the Pacific Islands. And some of that renewed interest is seen in, for instance, more recently, the US Innovation and Competition Act of 2020, or proposed legislation such as the Blue Pacific Act by Ed Case, uh, the representative from Hawaii, or the Honoring Oceania Act by Brian Swartz, the senator from Hawaii. And also we've seen this 
renewed interest in the framing of our traditional development partners approach and assistance to the region, the US through the Pacific Pledge, our friends from Australia through the Pacific Step Up, our friends from Aotearoa, New Zealand, the Pacific Reset, and Great Britain you know, is back as well through their Pacific Uplift. But there are also others drawing their interest or mapping their interest in the region. One that I would like to note is Indonesia through the Pacific Elevation. And that has huge implication for discussions of the kinds of powers that now have an interest in the region. Not only Euro-American power, but in this case, we have a Southeast Asian emerging power. And of course, China through its maritime silk road. And so the question then arises, so how do Pacific Island governments and Pacific Island countries respond to this? What, what are they saying? Where do Pacific Island countries fit into this geopolitical competition? Are they just spectators in somebody else's mapping of the region? Or are they trying to push back and draw their own maps of what the Pacific Island looks like and also the agendas that they see as important. And there are a couple of things that I want to note about the Pacific Islands here. The first is the maturity of diplomacy. So during the Cold War period, I mentioned earlier on that a lot of the Pacific Island countries were either not independent or had just gained independence. Over the years, however, a lot of these governments and countries have matured somewhat and also matured in their diplomacy between each other as well as with the outside world. And this is reflected in their engagement and participation in international forums such as the United Nations. And also very importantly, their leadership in some of these international forums, particularly on issues such as climate change. There are also issues surrounding small island developing states. So we are now dealing with countries, small as they may be, that have a generation of diplomats that have had that interaction with each other and the outside world for a number of decades. And therefore maturity in the diplomacy of Pacific Island countries. Perhaps it's not the same as Australia and New Zealand and the US, but nevertheless, that kind of maturity. And so they are able, for instance, to get together in New York, you know, those that have offices in New York and talk to each other and, uh, and talk about how they would approach issues at the international arena. So that's important, the maturity of diplomacy of Pacific Islands. The second is the new Pacific diplomacy or what Greg Fry and Sandra Tad have referred to as the new Pacific diplomacy. That along with that maturity is a certain degree of assertiveness of Pacific Island interests regionally as well as internationally. And also we've seen out of that, the establishment of organizations a lot of the traditional regional organizations that we know, like the Pacific Islands Forum, the Forum Fisheries Agency, the University of the South Pacific, uh, SPC, and so forth, have their histories in the colonial period. And yes, they are still useful. Although, as we know, the Pacific Island Forum has been going through uh, some issues because of the Micronesian countries uh, intending to pull out of it. But we've seen the emergence of organizations like the Pacific Islands Development Forum, which Fiji spearheaded as a response in part, as a response to the way Fiji was treated following the 2006 coup. Uh, yes, the Pacific Islands Development Forum has its weaknesses, but it was able to rally not only government officials, but private sector, NGO, church leaders, a 
cross-section of Pacific Islanders to have conversations in ways that the Pacific Island Forum or SPREP or other regional government, uh, other intergovernmental regional organizations were unable to do. And then of course, the sub-regional organizations like the Melanesian Spearhead Group or MSG. And as I mentioned, you know, of course these organizations have a lot of weaknesses and have a lot of challenges, but you see the emergence of new organizations and below that, the interconnection between Pacific Islanders in informal ways. For instance, throughout the COVID-19 period, I've had Zoom conversations with people across the Pacific Islands, organized not by governments, but just Pacific Islanders to look at issues that are of importance to the Pacific or simply to get together and have kava and have Zoom conversations or Zoom kava sessions. And so you have that maturity, you have that new Pacific diplomacy. And out of that emerged this thing called the Blue Pacific. A lot of that discussion took place at the Pacific Islands Forum. The idea of the Blue Pacific as an alternative way, if not an addition to looking at the region beyond just the Indo-Pacific and bringing attention to the Pacific Islands region. And so in 2017, the Pacific Island Forum launched this thing called the Blue Pacific. And the former prime minister of Samoa during that meeting, and I'll quote him, said, the Blue Pacific will strengthen the existing policy frameworks that harness the ocean as a driver of transformative social, cultural, political, economic development in the Pacific. It gives renewed impetus to deepening Pacific regionalism. So a couple of things about the Blue Pacific idea, which is closely connected to the idea of the framework for Pacific regionalism. And the first is, deepening regionalism, that Pacific Island countries know that in order to be able to survive or to make a difference in the international arena, the idea of collective diplomacy is vital. And we've seen it work in the past. Take for instance, the Pacific Islands or South Pacific US Tuna Agreement was possible because Pacific Island countries have come together. The anti-nuclear treaty or the Rarotonga treaty are examples of where collective diplomacy had worked for Pacific Island countries. And so deepening regionalism became really, really important under the Blue Pacific. Uh, of course, you know, at the moment that has been, you know, the, the, because of the issues within the Pacific Island Forum, uh, uh, people are wondering whether this deepening of regionalism is going to work move, moving forward. But it's important to note that whilst our Micronesian brothers and sisters, the Micronesian countries intend to leave the Pacific Island Forum, they're still members of many of the other regional organizations that, that we have in the region, FFA, SPREP, SPC, uh, uh, USP and so forth. The second thing about the Blue Pacific is, is the idea of the Blue Continent. So this is an issue of identity and mapping that I talked about earlier on. But it is also fundamental to think about it in terms of Pacific Islanders saying, we're not just small island states in the Pacific Islands. We are ocean states. And because we are ocean states that are interconnected, and because we are part of this ocean, we are a huge blue continent. So the idea of moving from small island states to being a blue continent or a huge blue continent. The third thing that you see in the Blue Pacific discussion is the idea of inclusive security. Uh, and the idea that the Indo-Pacific as we know it tends to focus a lot on military security. The Pacific Island countries are saying that there is a need for discussions of inclusive security that includes human security, human 
humanitarian assistance, environmental security. And at the center of discussions of environmental security, of course, is the issue of climate change. The fourth issue from the Blue Pacific is this idea of belonging and of responsibility. This idea of custodianship, stewardship to the Pacific Ocean. That we as Pacific Islanders belong to this place. This is not some geopolitical space for us. This is home. This is where we belong. And because it is where we belong, we have responsibility to it. We have responsibility to ensuring the survival of its environment to which we depend on for our own survival. And so that idea of stewardship is also foundational to the idea of the Blue Pacific. So what does that look like in terms of the way in which Pacific Island countries have organized themselves? The Boyer Declaration, for instance, which was signed in 2018, centers climate change as the most important existential threat for Pacific Islands. It didn't say China is the most important existential threat. It says climate change for Pacific Islands is the most important threat that we face today. And therefore any discussions of security must include climate change as central to it. So how does China fit into this blue Pacific idea? China by and large is absent in a lot of the discussions, but for a lot of Pacific Island places, they welcome China's addition as in the, to the existing development partners that we have. So China not ne necessarily as an alternative, but China as an addition to the relationships that Pacific Island countries have with Australia, New Zealand, the US, France, and so forth. And it's a welcome addition for a lot of Pacific Island governments. And I'll make a distinction between governments and people in a little bit. So China, welcome. Uh, and a lot of this engagement with China happens at the multilateral level through organizations such as the Pacific Island Forum. But a lot of it though happens at the bilateral level. The relationship between countries. And we all know, I'm sure our listeners know about the fact that in September, 2019, Solomon Islands and Kiribati switched diplomatic relationship from Taiwan and recognized the People's Republic of China. So China is lingering there in this, as Pacific Islanders try and make sense of their place in this changing regional order. There are a couple of concerns about the China presence, a couple of challenges that are well known to many of us. And the first is, this idea of dead book diplomacy, that Pacific Island countries, because of the concessional loans that they receive from China, will leave them indebted to China. And there is a certain degree of truth in that. If you look at, say, the specific cases, so if you look at the totality of Pacific Island debt, uh, they owe a lot more money to other financial institutions than to China. However, the story changes if you look at specific countries. So Tonga, for instance, Tonga owes a huge amount of money to China. Increasingly Samoa and Vanuatu and Fiji uh, and Papua New Guinea. So these, that's a real issue that Pacific Islanders have to think about in managing their relationship with Beijing. The second issue is the behavior of Chinese corporate entities. So a lot of the discussions about the relationship with China tends to focus on the Chinese state. But I think that equally important are the role that Chinese corporate entities play, both in enhancing China's diplomacy or in sometimes they become a liability to Beijing because of their behavior. So they come in, they do things, and even if they were not instructed by Beijing, people immediately see them 
as representing Beijing. The other thing to note here is that for a lot of Pacific Islander, their encounter with China is not the state. Their encounter with China is either the Chinese businessman or woman who owns the store in Port Moresby or Honiara or the small village shops in, in, in Tonga, Tonga Tapu, or in other parts of the Pacific. That's their encounter with China. That's, the, that's, that's what they see when they see China. So the operations of Chinese businesses is also very, very important. And we can talk about that more later on. The other thing I want to note is the differences between Pacific Island people and Pacific Island governments. So if you look at a lot of these relationships, they are, of course, between the governments. They are intergovernmental relationships. But in a lot of cases, uh, Pacific Islander people think quite differently from their government. And I'll take one case, for instance, Solomon Islands. And Solomon Islands reached diplomatic relations from Taiwan to the People's Republic of China, there was a lot of resistance or a lot of expressions of concern by Solomon Islands. The government, however, went ahead uh, and created that relationship. We've seen falling out between Malaita province and the central government in Honiara. And a lot of that is, yes, it's about international relations, but it's also about people appropriating issues of international relation for domestic politics. So the intersections between domestic politics and international relations, which have an impact on both politics and the livelihood of people at the very local level. So that difference between government and people and the intersection between local and international relations, politics is also important. More recently, we've seen uh, a, a lot of that Chinese diplomacy through COVID-19 diplomacy, the provision of assistance to Pacific Island countries. Uh, and it would be interesting to see, because uh, the Chinese government has supplied some, not all Pacific Island countries with Sinopharm and, and, and Sinovax. It would be interesting to see how ordinary people respond to these things. Okay, a couple of other things before I stop. Uh, the first the one is Pacific agency. So, you know, Pacific Islanders are not new to global power competition. We've been part of it for a very long time through the colonial period, through the Cold War period. Now we've seen more international global competition between different powers. And this is where I come back to the story about the anti-nuclear movement and our chant that if it is safe, dump it in Tokyo, test it in Paris, store it in Washington, DC, but keep my Pacific nuclear free. And this is a chant that we as young people used in the 1980s, but I think it's still relevant today in trying to understand how Pacific Islanders respond to these global powers. And a couple of things about it, the first, is proactive organization that we organized as students in the 1980s and those before us in the 1970s on issues of decolonization and to stop nuclear testing in the region. That proactive organization, I think continues in the region, not only at the governmental level, but also amongst ordinary Pacific Islands. And issues of climate change, for instance, issues of illegal fishing uh, and so forth. So proactive organizing by Pacific Islanders to respond to the global events that are taking place. And along with proactive organizing is the idea of asserting Pacific Island interests, telling global powers that, hey, look, yeah, you might be concerned about military invasion. Our biggest concern is climate change. So trying to assert the interests of Pacific Island countries and Pacific people. And third is that invocation of a sense of belongingness 
and claiming ownership and stewardship that I mentioned earlier on. In the slogan or in the chant on anti-nuclear movement, we say, my Pacific. But also a sense of responsibility of ensuring a nuclear-free Pacific. So that idea of stewardship on climate change issues on issues that are important to us today. And let me just make a few remarks in conclusion. The first is that, you know, as global powers deal with Pacific Islands or they draw their, they map their interests in this part of the world through either the Maritime Silk Road or through the Indo-Pacific strategy, I think it is important to recognize the agency of Pacific Island countries and people to be able to identify where Pacific Islanders are trying to express that agency. It is also important to recognize and respect the interests and priorities to Pacific Islands. And also there is the question of how can the values of the Blue Pacific as we express it be reflected in the languages and the strategies of this grand geopolitical maps such as the Indo-Pacific. For example, how can issues of climate change be featured in the Indo-Pacific strategy and the discussions? So those are a couple of things that I wanna leave us with and uh, I'll stop here and wait for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tercisius. Uh, that was a superb tour of the horizon, authoritative, articulate, informed, and I'm sure that our audience has achieved a far richer appreciation of the challenges facing Pacific Island microstates as a result of your analysis. I have a number of questions of my own, um, but let me look at one comment that you made, and that relates to the securitization of diplomacy. It strikes me self-evidently that there are several narratives at work that when a government like the one in the Solomon Islands is negotiating with Beijing, uh, there's one narrative uh, in terms of economic development assistance and so forth. But from the perspective of regional capitals like Canberra, Wellington, Washington, uh, there is a deep concern about the security implications of a greater Chinese presence. And I was thinking about the fact that when you were a young student uh, at USP, uh, marching in the streets of Suva uh, in the mid 1980s, uh, that was a time when there was a deep anxiety, not about the Chinese, but about the Russians beginning to position themselves uh, in Kiribati. Uh, as a potential base for tracking uh, American activities or, or submarine operations by the Soviets. So uh, to what degree do you feel that there's a legitimate anxiety or concern about the possibility of Chinese constructing uh, naval facilities, which would in fact impose a Chinese presence between uh, the American West Coast and Hawaii on the one hand, and Australia, New Zealand, and the other. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James. That's a really important question. And I, I don't want to downplay the anxiety of Australia, New Zealand, or the US. Uh, and I am sure that they have good reasons to be concerned about Chinese presence uh, or Chinese, China's increasing influence in the region, particularly given what we've seen in places like the South China Sea uh, and other places where the Chinese have been involved. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they've expressed that, as you mentioned, uh, concerns about the port in Santo in Vanuatu, uh, when Solomon Island switched, there was a company that wanted to buy Tulagi, uh, one of the islands in the Solomon Islands. Uh, and so there's real concern in this, and I can understand why Canberra or people in Canberra, Wellington, or Washington, D.C. would be really concerned about that. 
Uh, but at the same time, I think, you know, whilst we privilege uh, this discussions about strategic concerns, concerns about military presence, that we do not undermine Pacific Islanders' concern about development issues. Uh, and, and, and I can see that the, uh, the traditional development partners are responding to this. Australia's infrastructure fund, for instance, uh, in Pacific Island places, I think addresses a lot of these things. The US is beginning to put money into development issues in Pacific Islands. In the case of Solomon Islands, uh, into forest management at the moment. Uh, and so we are beginning to see that, uh, but I, 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 I still think that, you know, yes, geostrategic military concerns are important, uh, but issues of environment are also equally important. How do we deal with it? Uh, trying to ensure that people have access to opportunities is important. Not sure that answers your question. Well, let me segue uh, Tarsisius from that answer, and I thank you for that, uh, to one of the questions posed by one of our viewers. Um, the question is, the Pacific Islands Forum recently agreed that their maritime boundaries should remain permanent, regardless of sea level rise due to climate change. Do you see this as an important precedent for similarly challenged countries elsewhere? And you alluded in passing in your answer a moment ago to the South China Sea, but um, I'd be interested in your views about uh, the forum's efforts to consolidate existing maritime boundaries over and against the effect of climate change uh, altering perceptions of those boundaries. Thank you. That, that's an important issue that our legal scholars are also dealing with. And, and uh, I'm sure many of our listeners know that the 200 miles exclusive economic zone is measured from the furthest island out. And the question arises, what happens if that furthest island out disappears? Does that mean that the exclusive economic zone or the EEZ of a certain country then reduces. Or there is also the possibility of what happens if an entire country disappears, uh, that nation states are land-based. We define them the, because of the existence of an island. Take Niue, Nauru, for instance, one island countries. What happens in situations where these islands disappear as a result of climate change. Does that mean therefore that the sovereign existence of this nation state no longer exists? Uh, and so those are legal issues that I think a lot of our people uh, are, are dealing with. I think the Pacific Island Forum is concerned about that uh, and trying to ensure that Pacific Island countries keep the EEZ that they have. And I think our listeners will know as well that for a lot of these countries, the EEZ is very, very important economically. Take Kiribati, for instance, very small land area with huge EEZ area. Uh, and therefore, it is important not only you know, in defining Kiribati's sovereign territory, but also in, in important in Kiribati's economy. Uh, and I think that decision and the discussions surrounding it are informed by politics, political existence, as well as economic existence. Yes, I always think of the Cook Islands with 90 square miles of land and 330,000 square miles of sea. Uh, in other words, an area equal to uh, Western Europe. Uh, and that brings me to uh, the next question, because it's contingent in many ways on sovereignty, on uh, resources, on uh, maritime regions. A question from one of our listeners, to what extent have Pacific Island states been involved 
in the, uh, I apologize, forgive me. To what extent is IUU fishing affecting the Pacific Islands? Is it a significant concern? And if so, how are the island states responding? A really great and important question. And yes, uh, illegal and unreported, unregulated fishing is a huge concern for Pacific Islands. And partly because, as we've just mentioned, that many of these places have huge exclusive economic zones, but do not have the capacity to be able to police those areas. Australia, through its uh, patrol boat program that's been going on for a while, supply some of the Pacific Island countries with patrol boats. I think Kiribati just received its boat maybe last week, and Samoa got its boat uh, wrecked on a reef in Samoa a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but so the Australians are trying to help with that. US Coast Guard is also helping with uh, you know, surveillance, uh, patrolling the EEZ and trying to ensure that this doesn't happen. But again, you know, despite the assistance from Australia, New Zealand and the French as well, it's really difficult to be able to police some of these huge EEZ. And on top of that, we've seen an increase in Chinese fishing boats. Uh, in the region. And that's a real concern because a lot of these boats are subsidized by the Chinese government and therefore are able to spend more time out in the ocean. So more days of fishing out there. So increasing Chinese vessels, uh, not all of it are registered. Uh, and so that causes problems because we do not know if they are in the region. Uh, and so that's a huge issue that Pacific Island governments and also through regional organizations such as the Foreign Fisheries Agency are trying to address. Uh, so absolutely right. It's, it's, it's a huge nightmare for a lot of the Pacific Island countries. And, and it creates losses in potential revenue. Yes, this issue I think was highlighted graphically uh, some months ago with some 300 Chinese fishing boats operating uh, close up to the Galapagos Islands off the Ecuadorian uh, coast. Um, another question, Tarsisius, if I may, and uh, the question is, the Pacific Islands region is often characterized as a competition area between the great powers of the United States and China, and the regional powers, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and Taiwan. But what avenues are there for cooperation for medium powers such as Canada? Uh, this being, in many cases, probably a largely Canadian audience, uh, I'd be very interested in your views. Uh, and indeed, parenthetically, Canada is attempting to articulate new policies with respect to the Indo-Pacific. So what, what role can uh, a middle power like Canada play to address uh, the needs and concerns of Pacific Island states? I, I think there is a potential for a, a lot more involvement in, 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 uh, by Canada. I think for a lot of Pacific Islanders, Canada is usually absent from our psyche uh, because it doesn't have the colonial history in the region as we have with other places. Uh, and where Canada is involved in a lot of cases, it's via organizations such as the Commonwealth. Uh, and so the former British countries therefore have that engagement. Uh, but I am sure that, you know, as Canada tries to define its role in the Indo-Pacific uh, and looks at issues beyond just strategic military security, then Canada could begin to define what kind of role it can play in the region either bilaterally with individual countries or through multilateral mechanisms as, such as regional organizations. Uh, the countries that play more visible role in the multilateral arrangements are the ones that have a post-forum dialogue status with the Pacific Islands Forum. Uh, China, for instance, the US, Indonesia and others. And maybe China could explore, uh, sorry, Canada could explore how can it engage with 
the multilateral or the regional organization, not only the forum, but such as foreign fisheries, because fisheries by its very nature affects not only Pacific Islands, but other places as well, including Canada. Uh, so involvement with the foreign fisheries agency, with SPC, with environmental issues, uh, with SP, uh, with uh, SPREP on environmental issues, with SPC on issues of education, for instance. And that raises another issue is education diplomacy. Uh, and so the US, when I was working with the East West Center, the US used to have five scholarships for the South Pacific that's paid for by the US Congress. So they bring five students over here to study at the University of Hawaii and the scholarship administered by the East West Center. That's gone down to three scholarships. In the meantime, in the past decade, China has offered about 2000 scholarships to Pacific Islanders. Uh, and of course, people will go where there is availability of funding. Uh, and so looking at how uh, Canada can have a bit more engagement with the Pacific tool, education diplomacy, I think it's very, very important. Thank you so much. Um, sadly, we're beginning to come towards the end of our session, but let me ask you to comment briefly on one more question. And that's with respect to Indonesia's greater interest and involvement in the Pacific Islands. Uh, uh, dealing with Jakarta raises some serious challenges, and I'd be uh, pleased to hear your views. Thank you. Yeah, so, so Indonesia is the emerging power in Southeast Asia, and it's strategically located, uh, and especially in relation to Indo-Pacific, because it is in the middle of the Pacific and Indian Ocean, and therefore it's strategically important to the U.S., to other powers uh, in the region as well. But Indonesia has other issues as well, internal domestic issue, one of which is the issue of West Papua uh, that has been around since the 1950s and which has been at the center of a lot of the discussions in the region. And so what we've seen in the last couple of years, particularly in the last five years or so, and maybe a little longer than that as well, is that Indonesia beginning to define itself as a Pacific Island nation, uh, that it is not just a Southeast Asian country, but it is a Pacific Island nation as well. And you see that in the rhetoric of Indonesian diplomats, uh, in Indonesian politicians. Uh, and part of the reason for that, and, and, and then you see it in Indonesia's involvement in the MSG, the Melanesian Spearhead Group and Indonesia arguing that it has one of the biggest pop Melanesian populations, and therefore it has a right to be a member of the Melanesian spearhead crew. What the Indonesian diplomats and government officials often do not say is that its Melanesian population has been one of the most brutally treated population within Indonesia and in the Pacific Islands region since the 1960s. Uh, and that's often not in the, the, the narrative that they are telling us. Uh, and so Indonesia is going to play an important role. Now they are you know, providing assistance to Pacific Island places uh, and emerging as a power that I think the US could deal with when dealing with Southeast Asia. And if they can become much more powerful, not only in Southeast Asia, but in the Pacific, then they can become a partner, which I think they are receptive to, a partner in the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, and so, yeah, Indonesia is vital. Well, as our listeners will attest, uh, the University of Hawaii is deeply honored and enriched by having a man of Dr. Kabarbaka's and Caliber. I think it's very good. Please continue. Sorry, our uh, sound broke briefly. No, no, I, I was just saying, uh, James, that, uh, you know, Indonesia is very important. And it's important that we as observers 
of geopolitics in the region. Uh, keep an eye on that. Thank you so very much. As I was observing a moment ago, the University of Hawaii is clearly honored and enriched by having an individual with such authority and knowledge on its staff. And I'd like to thank you, Tarsicius, for a superb review of the challenges facing uh, the uh, states of Oceania. And uh, it will be particularly uh, enlightening for many of our viewers who perforce have tended to look beyond to India or China, Russia, and have failed to comprehend the complexities and opportunities of Oceania. Uh, many of you will in fact wish to review uh, our speakers comments today and in that respect a video of the webinar will be made available on YouTube. Uh, all you need to do is search under MSC conference on YouTube and you'll find uh, today's proceedings. Uh, I'd like to thank our MSC partners, uh, the Navy League of Canada and the Daniel K. Inoue Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in uh, Waikiki, Hawaii. And also to thank our sponsors. Uh, you can see them on the screen, Lockheed Martin, MDA, General Dynamics, Canadian Defense Review, Esprit de Corps, and Vanguard Magazine. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you today. Uh, you've given of your time and interest to assess uh, the importance of Oceania. Uh, the Maritime Security Challenge series uh, will continue. And it is our objective to bring to you world-class speakers to assess the emerging maritime realm and its importance for Canada. There will be a brief uh, Lockheed Martin video, which will now play at the conclusion of this webinar. Thank you so very much for your close attention today. And thank you, Tarsicius. At Lockheed Martin, we're on a mission. Your mission. When millions of people are counting on you, you can count on us. To build the impossible, to invent the inconceivable and solve every problem with speed and reliability. Every mission is an expedition of the greatest importance, both to you and to us.